quick introduction about myself, obviously always heels required. I am a head teacher at uh, the free school, Cumbria Academy for Autism. Um, before that, I was a deputy head for uh, three years in Sefton, in a, again another special needs school, and before that, uh, a sort of more challenging school for children with autism who just didn't really fit anywhere. <clears throat> My background, I've got you know, obviously an MSc in psychology, MPQH and all that, but it's an area that's interested me for a long time, and when this possibility to get involved with the Autism Academy began, you know, I, I jumped at it. And to tell you a little bit about how this sort of free school came about, there are loads of people with autism up and down the country, and there's loads of provision and provision units, and hopefully more and more special schools. But in Cumbria, uh, there wasn't. And you can sort of see on the screen quite high rates of people with autism in Cumbria. Um, I think it's actually one of the highest in the country. Um, and basically, there was no ASC school. Um, so a grassroots movement got together, spearheaded by a lady called Lynn Thornton, who is now our uh, head of governors, and basically got our people to work together and lobby central government to allow a free school to open, so it would be paid for by, by central government. And that's what she was able to do. It took her about five years. Um, and we now have this free school. I got on board in the January before it opened in September, and I got to see the building being built and have an impact on that, hire all the staff, and I'm very proud to have opened the school and, like I say, for it now to be open for, for a year and a half. And, and what's different about that is that it's specifically for students of ASC. Um, this is our vision, and it is, as it says, it's those lifelong opportunities to have those students achieve the full potential because if they went to a mainstream school, they might not get that same level playing field. And that's often what happens. I'm not saying that there should be a special school for everybody. I would love it if there was. But actually, sometimes having students in mainstream school is the right answer. But quite often, sometimes special schools are more useful because they can provide a much more tailored experience. If the child is struggling in mainstream, and it is difficult to be in a class of 30 and to have your individual needs met, if you're in a class of five, six, seven, or eight kids, you've got a lot more chance of getting your needs met. And it's giving that level playing field access, allowing these individuals who are capable to get their needs met so they can become the best versions they can be. And that's why I, I work in special needs and why I work in, in, in this industry. And we're trying to create a school environment that gives these children the same access that everybody should have. So we're using the national curriculum. So we've got children in primary, we've got children in secondary. You know, we're, we're following what you would expect. English, math, science, all those national curriculum subjects. But you can't just teach academic skills. You've got to teach social skills too. If people aren't comfortable from points of anxiety and able to interact with the people in the class or to express themselves, you've got to work on that too. So our curriculum is very much based on social progress as well as academic progress because you've got to work on both. But at the same time, you've also got to get them to achieve some qualifications so that when they move on to post-16 or colleges, ideally university or employment, they are able to show that they've got the same skills, that they're employable, that you know they can access their next levels. So it's getting a balance between the social and the academic, because you have to work on both. OK, this is just a little insight into our school. Here are a couple of pictures of our students in action. You know, we are a school. Here they are in classes. We've got classrooms. We've got a hall, the changing rooms. But the environment is lovely. Our corridors are three times as wide as a high school's corridor, so people can walk past each other feel safe. Our acoustics have been designed so you know that there's, there's no echoes, um, there's carpet on the floor. All of these sensory things have been considered to help meet the students' needs to make that environment more appropriate for them. And we've also got specialist rooms too. Here's a couple of pictures. We've got an immersion suite which is where we've made it snow. We can create a, an environment and immerse the students in the environment. So if they're scared to go to the dentist or the doctors or the station or the airport, then we can place them in that experience very, very carefully. And we use a lot of sensory, as you can imagine, with the machines outside. Um, people need to spin, people need to jump, people need to hang upside down and all sorts of stuff. And we're aware of that. So we allow that opportunity and possibility to make them feel more comfortable. Um, so that's our environment, and that is what makes us unique. We're working with the individuals, with the family, trying to understand them as an individual. We're adapting the learning, the environment. We're not a traditional classroom. There isn't a teacher at the front teaching the same lesson to the whole class. It's, it's a case of a maths lesson or an English lesson, and everybody is working at their own individual level. They break off into small groups, or we pair them up, or they work independently, but they work on their own strategies and their, on their own work. This reduces anxiety, 
we have a culture of calmness, positivity, we're understanding them. You know, I've heard a lot today so far about, you know, people feeling uncomfortable to disclose. You know, in this environment, people are proud of their autism, people know that they have autism, and we're trying to understand each other's aspect of autism. And then that's really important to have that open, honest culture and dialogue so we can actually meet their needs. You know, individuals have things in place for one child that another child doesn't have because that's the strategy that that child needs. So it could be that that child can stand up and walk out of the classroom. They don't need to ask permission, they just know they can go. And the teachers know they can do it because we have a strategy in place which is appropriate for them. Because not everyone can say, I'm overloaded, sir, can I please leave the room? It doesn't work, does it? You just need to leave the room. So we have that level of understanding in place. And we're promoting this so that they can achieve these strategies and so fit in and have lifelong experiences, whether it be work, university, a job, a successful relationship in the future, whether they can live in their own home without having support. So this is really what it's about. Okay, that's all our good intentions of what we're trying to do in the school. And then what I always think about, because obviously I didn't go straight into teaching, I, I worked in, in the world of work myself, you know, what happens after the schools there? Schools like myself now are special schools where you are meeting these individual needs, but what happens next? Post-16, universities, and I, and I know and I heard today already the good work that's happening in universities, but you do often come across post-16 establishments and they haven't got that same level of understanding set up. When a student achieves in special schools and goes to post-16 places, quite often, they, despite having achieved the qualifications, whether they get their five level twos, they're not offered the level three courses that they should. They're put into the disability group or they're put into the lower ability group and they have to prove their way up. And that support and understanding is often not in place. It is a form of discrimination and it is taking place and it does happen up and down in universities as well, but there's a lot more understanding to try to stop this from happening. And again, this is an article here which you can click on later which just talks about this, but it is improving, but the point of days like this and for us to talk about it is to recognize that there are still problems. So we know that with statistics such as this, and again, you know, this statistic's been shared already, but you know, 32% of autistic uh, people are in employment. That's terrible. You know, it's, it's not enough. 77% of unemployed autistic adults want employment. There's a lot of ground to be made here, and it's about all of the things that we've talked about so far, the disclosure, it's about the person understanding themselves, and also the workplace making those changes. So this is why we're going to talk about it. Why, why is it happening? Well, they're not, people in the working world are not getting the support that they need. The system isn't set up to help individuals and to help individual needs. There are laws in place, but quite often from the experiences people we talk to, this is not the experience that they're getting. There are laws, it's worth mentioning them because they do exist. You know, the Autism Act 2009, first ever Disability Act for autism passed in the UK. You know, this was because there was a national recognition that there was a serious issue here and that people with autism were not getting their needs met. We've got a Disability Act and Equality Act. We've got children with VHCPs, which say what they're entitled to up until the age of 24. But again, when you go into universities, it's become a complication too. You know, the law recognizes, and we've mentioned it several times today, this reasonable adjustments. You know, it, it exists, and this duty of it is anticipatory. It's supposed to be in place for individuals. But the problem is, what is reasonable? Because the Act says it should be reasonable adjustments. Um, reasonable adjustments put in place, but it doesn't say what is reasonable. Uh, the idea, and its strength and its weakness, is that this reasonableness, what's reasonable for one person, isn't necessarily reasonable for another. But you can interpret that so you can get the support that the individual needs. And that was the, 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 the reason for using this language in law. But unfortunately, because it's not so concrete, people struggle with it. Because its weakness is that it's hard to explain. It's hard to justify what a workplace should do. Because actually, it's at an individual level. And it needs to be considered at an individual level. And that's where the complication is. And again, it is the duty of the workplace, it's the duty of the school or, or wherever it is to actually have this in place. But the only way of doing that is to be disclosed, is for the person to have a conversation, is to actually sit down and talk about, as an individual with autism, what do I need in my workplace? So the conversation has to be open. And that isn't always something that workplaces are prepared to do. And that is the discrimination that people face. But it's being able to have that in place so that people know it needs to be there. And so people need to be able to talk about it. And again, special schools like this, we're very aware of it. And so we're working with people very upfront. We have plans in place, proactive plans, active plans, reactive plans. That way of working needs to get into 
It's a mainstream culture because we need to be open to talking about it and saying what needs to be done. It's not about waiting for it to go wrong, for someone to be overloaded, for the, to be, to, you know, for the red mist or all the other expressions that we have, for someone to have that, that problem. It's not about that. It's about stopping those problems from happening. Okay. So, I would suggest, and what we do in schools, and what should be happening, is that people should be being proactive. Yeah? We need to focus on that individual. Yeah? We need to work out and agree what support that person needs to reduce the anxiety and the challenge that they face. Yeah? And it, that's where it's reasonable, to help them cope, so the playing field can be leveled. Yeah, it needs to be planned out, spoken with the manager, spoken with the school, spoken with the employer. And this can be all sorts of things. It can be just a physical timetable. That makes a massive difference to a lot of our students. Schedules, additional breaks, any sort of concession that helps, an allowance, a differentiation. You know, these are, these are, these are simple things and simple words, but make a massive difference to people. Just a change in the demand, a change in the pressure, whether it be additional time or access. You know, all these things exist. I mean, access arrangements have existed for a long time with exams. But those access arrangements need to be in place all the time within workplaces. And again, active strategies. So when things start to go wrong, how do we stop it from going wrong? You know, our students that we work with and our colleagues, you know, a lot of people have those moments where they get overloaded. And those unusual challenges and unusual behaviors can be seen. This person might slam or walk away or shout or scream or make noises or flap or, or anything. Well, th these are just expressions. All of these things are just an expression of, of meaning. It, you know, all behavior is, is communication, and we have to remember that. They're not challenges. They can be challenging to someone because you're not used to seeing it, but they're just an expression for that individual. And again, it's helping the person adapt with that so other people don't have so much a problem when they do it because they're doing it to help themselves or because they've lost control for a moment. But it's about giving that control back. And that can be having soothing items in sight. I've had multiple arguments with many schools about why can the child not have on the desk the toys that make them calm whilst they're learning because they're keeping them calm. Fidget spinners were a big thing a few years ago. Same principle. If a fidget spinner keeps someone attentive and paying attention, then what's the problem? Whether it be toilet breaks or music or employees wearing music headphones or, or anything like that, or changing the lighting or reducing the, the rooms or, or just even changing the desks, all of these things are just sensible, reasonable adjustments which should be considered and adapted. And I think that's what, as a school, I know we do and I think a lot of schools are trying to do and again, workplaces, we want them to be more proportionate and understand the individual, understand the individual's autism, be empathic with their condition, try and understand the world through their eyes. You know, put these very simple things into place, reduce their anxieties, put these strategies in place, listen to their strategies. Yeah? And that's pretty much what, what, what I wanted to sort of say. And it's not the real world, and I'm conscious of time. I've just been sort of said, can I round up now? So all of this needs to happen because the real world is quite tough. And if we don't put these things into place, this real world will not get any better for individuals. There are a few more slides, but I'm being asked to round up, so the slides will be there. Thank you very much. I'm going to end it there if that's okay. <laughs>